Okay. Today we're going to talk about origin stories for the nation, um, America. And here we're talking about the national construct, about the United States of America. Um, how did it begin? That's our question. Where did it begin? Uh, who did it begin with? What's the origin story of our nation as you've received it? Just sort of think about that. Um, and just to get at and into our point for the day, it's best to, you know, right now for this moment to be not too scholarly in your thoughts. Um, what comes to mind first when, when I ask, what are America's beginnings, right? What's the, what's sort of the first imagistic set of, um, set of options? What's the first storyline? What's the first mythic, uh, narrative, right? Where did the nation start and who started it, right? What has your education taught you? For most of us, educated in American public schools and raised on American television, uh, the nation's beginning is a kind of mishmash, right, of pilgrims and Puritans and Thanksgiving and the Mayflower. Um, all that is kind of loosely related to Columbus and his Nina and uh, Pinta and Santa Maria, right, but only loosely related. Not really clear on that. Um, in the popular and canonical narrative, Columbus was an explorer, he was a discoverer, increasingly also recognized to be a mercenary and an environmental and social exploiter um, and a slaver, right? But the Columbus narrative, as it, you know, at, as it has been in turn celebrated or challenged or critiqued, questioned, reformulated, pushed back against, all of that, it's never really been the nation's foundation narrative, right? Um, in the popular consciousness and in public school textbooks, it's been the discovery of the new world, right? So-called new world, but it's never been the beginning of America per se. The text we're looking at today, uh, 1620s Mayflower Compact and 1630s um, City on a Hill speech as it's gone down, John Winthrop's Arabella speech, these texts have been at the, uh, at the center of, Americans, of America's origin stories. Um, in the Charlie Brown Thanksgiving cultural, you know, exemplar as it is, uh, when their dinner of sort of popcorn and jelly beans um, and toast is about to be served, Peppermint Patty asks for a prayer, uh, and Linus stands up and delivers, and they've, I've included a printed version um, of his prayer. He begins in the year 1621. Right, And then he goes on to tell the story of the first Thanksgiving where he tells us the colonists also said a prayer, one that ended with something like, um, we thank God for the opportunity to create a new world for freedom and justice. Right, That's the canonical narrative, that creation of a new world Right, that's built into the stories that we tell ourselves about ourselves and most importantly that we tell our children um, right, about the world that they live in, how it's been constructed, what makes it meaningful. Right. This is the this is the perpetuated origin story. Um, the story is told in greater detail, and in a way that really presses upon the origin narrative part. In 1988's um, the Mayflower Voyagers, which was the first episode in the This Is America Charlie Brown series, um, in which you know all of the Peanuts gang travel to America, where they find um, natives who miraculously speak English and go to sort of go through, this is America. This is the story we tell ourselves about ourselves. They go through the classical narrative in much more detail um, of this Plymouth colony, right? Story of the nation's beginnings that the nation likes to see itself through. That's what I'm getting at. I don't mean to sound overly cynical here. Um, there is history here to be learned and to learn from, right? We're gonna turn to the text, but part of that history is the history of choices made right? And Charlie Brown made a choice, you know, or really represents a choice that Americans made. Um, it's the Pilgrims and the Puritans, and we'll get once more to the difference between those two groups um, in just a second, but it's New England, Massachusetts, really. That's the origin. Um, 1620 and 1630, that's, that's what's gone down as the nation's origin, but, you know, you say, okay, well, you're harping on this a bit, right? And this is why, right? The Spanish settled St. Augustine in, in what's now called Florida in 1565, right? And the English settled Jamestown in now Virginia in 1607, right? And a decade before that, the Dutch made their way up the, up the Hudson River Valley and planted towns that are still there, right? So the Pilgrims and the Puritans were not the first settlers. They weren't the first European settlers. They weren't the first European Christian settlers, right? So how do they rate, right? How do they get to be the story that we tell ourselves about ourselves, about the nation's beginnings? 
And here's why. They had a story, right? One that later Americans wanted to see themselves through. Looking back from the vantage of history, right, the Spanish settlers, besides being Spanish, right, and not Anglo-European, um, right, besides that, they were, you know, they were really here on a conquistador model. I mean, they were, right, coming for glory and power and riches. Uh, and the Dutch of the New Netherlands, they were merchants, right? Their work was in trading posts and sales routes. Jamestown seems to be the strongest counterclaim for origin in that it's Anglo-Christian, uh, working in the same system as Massachusetts was, right? Um, but again, looking back, it's just not as attractive of a narrative, right? Um, sorry. Those guys were a bunch of, you know, rough and rowdy, swashbuckling venture capitalists in, in Virginia, totally committed to enforcing by martial law uh, severe religious rules, right? And these were folks who a year before the Mayfla Mayflower landed, a year before the Mayflower landed in 1619, bought humans, right, who had been stolen from their own land um, and sold as property by the Dutch. With the Mayflower, the nation had an early enough origin story that was also purpose-driven, right? The Mayflower voyagers, as Charlie Brown calls them, um, they were moving toward an ideal, not just money or power, and they weren't just fleeing from danger either. The ostensible motivation for getting on a rickety wooden boat and crossing unknown seas was to establish religious freedom, right? They sailed from Holland, having already been chased out of England, and they were poor. They were separatist, and we've talked a little bit about this in a previous lecture. They'd been swindled by some savvy businessmen. Um, they were sailing off already in debt. Uh, through a contract they had with the Virginia company. They had nothing, right? This was their last chance. It's kind of a classic underdog story. It's just really set up for it, right? But, you know, storms and currents and whatnot, and it turns out that they didn't land in the Virginia territory, in the jurisdiction of the Virginia company, where they were beholden by contract, right? They landed in what was, from the perspective of the settler colonialists of the time, a total no man's land, right? Off the grid. So they needed laws being under no one else's. Right? With the brief document you read, now known as the Mayflower Compact, this group of 102 people um, established the first document of self-government by the colonists in the Americas. Right? It was signed by the men. There were 41 of them. Um, but of the whole bunch, fewer than half of them were separatists. Right? Um, the rest were along for the ride. They were paid to be there, or they were indentured servants, as were two of the men who signed the compact, and that's notable. Their voices were seen as crucial for the compact, right? Indentured servants or paid, you know, riders on the, on the you know, or, or folks in charge, right? It was an all-hands-on-deck situation. Um, they needed to survive. They needed a compact to do it. In this oh-so-brief document, they agreed to stay loyal to the king of England, um, to remain faithful to Christianity, a certain sort of it, uh, and to work together towards shared ends to unite themselves in a body politic, right? And we'll see uh, those who risked everything, right? And the pilgrims, they really did risk it all and with their kids, right? They, they really did. And, and okay, so this is worth a digression. Um, it really is worth asking, right? What would you get on a rickety boat uh, and sail across unknown seas to an uncertain future in defense of? Like, what would make you do that? Um, what would you do that for? What would be worth all that to protect? It's the bold idealism, the total commitment to a sense of higher purpose, uh, in this case, religious freedom and civil liberty, that's made this story compelling to future generations. I mean, they really did risk it all. It's like, I don't know, like, would you get on a, what would make you get on a, on a rocket ship to, to Mars with, with, with your kids um, to defend, right? I don't know. Okay, end of the digression. We'll see that those who risked it all for religious freedom, um, the pilgrims, the Puritans, and others, well, once they got themselves just a little bit settled, they were quick to deny those freedoms to anyone else. That happened. Um, with startling, though not complete, regularity. That's what happened. So on to 1630. Um, ten years after the pilgrims landed in what became Plymouth, the Puritans, led by John Winthrop, whom you see here, made their way to the Massachusetts Bay, right? And this was a different sort of group. First, as we've learned, they weren't separatists. They wanted to purify, but not outright reject the Church of England. And also they had money. Uh, Winthrop was appointed governor by contract before the voyage ever happened. 
So, and they came in a minor fleet, right? Um, they had resources, they had backing. They didn't struggle so much. Not as many people starved. They got on their uh, got on their feet much more quickly once they landed and developed a colony. And the text we read, the model of Christian charity, um, which has gone down as the city on the hill speech. Uh, we talked about this text briefly at the start of the semester when we looked at American civil religion and American exceptionalism. Um, American exceptionalism was established before America, right? And this text has become really recently its foundation document as we'll see in more like the 20th century, right? Winthrop's brief speech has come to embody American exceptionalism. It's become a proof text for what America would be, for what it is. All the aspiration to do justly and to love mercy and to, to be a real and true model for the nations of the world. Um, it's all here. This is it, thought 20th century America. Um, this is how we want to see ourselves. This is an origin story that we can we can get some traction in, you know? Winthrop giving his speech still aboard ship to a group of weary Puritans who had, you know, run, ridden over rough seas, right? It's all drama to boot, you know? It's cinematic in scope and it's spectacular in ambition and it's a great story. And, and so he did, probably didn't actually give the speech on the boat. Okay. Um, Abram C. Van Engen has written an incredible book, which I've pictured here, that traces the history of this speech. Um, which is just fascinating. It really attends to the question of how ideas and beliefs, the ones that the nation wanted to believe about itself, how these made Massachusetts the origin story that stuck. These are the ones uh, who came in search of something better, right? Risking everything for civil and religious liberty, establishing democracy against all odds. Van Engen says that origin stories are, quote, present day definitions cast back onto history. And the pilgrims and the Puritans have given America a story shaped and driven by exceptional ideals, right? By principles. And the speech uh, is real. It's, it's really from 1630. It's not something that the 20th century sort of cast back onto history. It was really there nearly 400 years ago, calling future Americans, that's us, to be as a city on a hill, urging us to do justly and love mercy and walk humbly with our God, right? A God that wasn't agreed upon then and certainly isn't agreed upon now. It was a real speech, um, but, and this is a, this is an image taken from Van Engen's book, um, this speech, you know, it wasn't printed. It, it wasn't even mentioned. It was completely ignored until 1838, and then it was printed once, um, and then ignored for another hundred years, right? So it wasn't until the Cold War, you can see here, until after World War II, mid 20th century that America began to see itself in the terms of Winthrop's speech, recuperated that speech and hasn't stopped talking about it since, right? As though it's been there the whole time. And then really quickly, America saw all of its national history as though projected from this moment in 1630 forward, right? Into today and past that, into the future. Like this is the speech that has defined us from the beginning, you know? So JFK cited the speech, but really it was Reagan who made this the go-to imagery for every major politician over the last 30 years. It was Reagan who, in his 1989 farewell address, called Winthrop, quote, an early freedom man who journeyed here on a little wooden boat in search of a home that would be free, right? And for Reagan, the shining city on the hill, he added shining and it kind of stuck. Um, it has been since Winthrop's time, quote, a magnet for all who must have freedom for all the pilgrims from all the lost places who are hurtling through the darkness toward home. Uh, it's poetic, it's delightful, right? And aside from the fact that Winthrop, Winthrop and his crew were not except themselves pilgrims, um, it's quite nice on its history. And he's big on history, Reagan is in this speech in this moment. He says, if we forget what we did, he said, we won't know who we are. And I agree with that. Uh, understanding religion in America means knowing something about its historical development, right? It means seeing the religious motivations of many of the early settler colonialists. It means recognizing that aspirations for freedom and for justice um, have been an authentic part of the settling of America. They've been there. The nation has functioned through history uh, into this day as something of a city on a hill for a lot of people who have come from other places seeking civil and religious freedom. It's also been, for many, a walled fortress of sorts, you know, shifting the metaphor against difference, right? A city that maintained and enforced a really limited and closed freedom. 
Um, in the Massachusetts Bay Colony, only male members of the church could vote or hold office. Anne Hutchinson was a Puritan who arrived in the Massachusetts Bay Colony in 1634 with her husband and 11 children. Um, and by the fall of 1637, she was on trial for heresy. She believed in and taught the importance of direct access of faith uh, over work. She held Bible study in her home and led that Bible study despite the fact that she was a woman. Um, these were apparently her heresies. Uh, and Winthrop banished her from the colony to near, near certain death, right? You get banished from a colonial outpost, basically, um, in the middle of a, you know, a, a country that's actually already inhabited by people who do not um, look kindly upon the settler colonial methods um, and yeah it's near certain death she went to what became what would become Rhode Island and then she ended up in what is now the Bronx in New York City um, and she was killed she was slaughtered along with her family in 1643 she was by far not the only one judged exiled ostracized uh, or outright killed by the religious authorities of the colonial era um, and the colonies were not unified they each had their own thing going on so who was getting killed in different colonies was different right we saw that Maryland was Catholic, Virginia was Anglican, Connecticut was a pretty severe Congregationalist, um, Pennsylvania was Quaker, Rhode Island was a haven for religious dissenters founded by Roger Williams, uh, who had himself been exiled from the Massachusetts Bay Colony a couple years before Hutchinson. By the early 1700s, right, moving forward a little bit, we'll see that there's far more religious diversity, freedom, intermixing, and movement still largely within a Christian context, within a Christian frame. Um, but the Reformation and the Enlightenment, those, you know, both of those movements increased interest in democracy. Um, and all of that led to a relaxation of these very stringent religious laws. Um, the 17th century laws regarding faith and practice started to, you know, loosen a bit. Um, in the 18th century or the 1700s, right? The, the kind of laws that would exile a Hutchinson or a Williams that would kill 25 people in Salem on charges of witchcraft, which was most likely herbal healing practices, you know, maybe some nature-based worship. Um, or laws like Connecticut's Code of 1650, which read, if any man shall have or worship any god but the Lord God, he shall be put to death. Now, what you have to understand about that is like, A, it's a capital crime to have any, have or worship any God but the Lord God. But what you also have to understand and appreciate is that who got to define whether the God, which is in the text capital G, is the same as the Lord God or is different, um, that get, you know, those were the, those were the magistrates. Those are the people in positions of authority. And that, uh, that really made um, set standards of orthodoxy according to sort of individual power-based whim. It was very tight, it was very closed, and it was very easy to kick people out or kill them. So those laws, a whole slew of them, started to be relaxed, right? At the end of the 17th century, um, on the whole not rejected, but definitely relaxed by the early 18th century. Which is what we'll turn to next, the early 18th century, to the awakenings um, or the revivals that have come to characterize religious uh, experience in America really until this day.